Two wolves live within you. One is vice, the other virtue. Which one grows the stronger? The one you feed? Or for some people, the one you transition into. <laughs> Hello there, my name is Jocelyn, you may call me Joy, and this is gonna be a thick, big fucking video. So I have broken it down into several parts, just for your convenience, um, but it needed to be done in this way because it is just such a huge topic, and I really, really needed to get it all out. So... So I'm going to be talking about trans women in women's spaces. I'm going to be doing this from the sort of trans angle of this, you know, my perspective um, and my sort of breaking down of this topic, reframing of this topic from a transgender perspective, okay? I am entering this discourse from a position that trans women are really women and belong in women's spaces. Trans men are really men and belong in men's spaces. Non-binary people are really non-binary and belong wherever the hell we feel most comfortable. <laughs> wherever we feel most safe and wherever we want to be. Which is really the crux of the matter, people feeling comfortable and safe in sex-segregated spaces. And although I am non-binary, I will refer to myself uh, in the group of trans women um, for the purpose of this video because I am trans feminine, that is, uh, my experiences align most closely with other trans women. Um, and until a few years ago, I hadn't even heard of non-binary, didn't know what it was. Um, or, like, I hadn't really heard of any other sort of genderqueer label at all. And thus I assumed myself to be a woman. And I still live like a woman in many different ways. So that's my position, that's where I'm coming from. You may wonder why the title of this video isn't inclusive to, of trans men. Um something along the lines of trans people in sex segregated spaces. Well, this discussion rarely focuses on trans men, either ignoring them completely or deliberately dismissing and downplaying their roles in society and in the discussion, in, in the fact that they can use facilities at all. And I will try to address some of these particular instances, um, but I can't speak for men. I can't speak for trans men because I'm not one. <laughs> but I do appreciate their input um, and their particular explanations and details and everything that they can provide. So, you know, if you are a trans man watching this and feel like I have missed something, please let me know. Um, or at least let me know that I've done a good enough, adequate enough job of representing you when I can. And the reason behind these omissions of trans men from and non-binary people from the conversations entirely is because of transphobia and sexism, um, both misogyny and misandry at play. And I will explain those more in detail later. Suffice to say that trans men are seen by transphobes as women pretending to be men and therefore are still silly little women who are, you know, they're, they're treated misogynistically because of that reason. They're downplayed, they're, they're belittled, and it's disgusting. And the reason that trans women are, again, 
by transphobes seen as men who are supposedly superior in some way to women and therefore are, at least biologically speaking, uh, and therefore are some kind of a threat to women. We will take a look and see that this just is not the case. But why does this even matter? Like, this discussion has been happening for quite some time now. There's no real consensus between two different sides of the arguments coming together. So why bother talking about it at all? Well, well the thing is that the existence of trans women in women's spaces, trans men in men's spaces, and non-binary people anywhere that's not, you know, fucking the middle of the woods, is being talked about on a political level. Trans people have been politicised for quite some time now, and the politicians who influence legislation are getting in on this action. As this part of the video is a political discussion, I'm going to defer to, yes, you guessed it, the expert. Hello there, I'm Ben Jamin, this channel's political correspondent and bodacious NB, and I'm going to explain why this is such a political topic. So we've got a great example for you today, MP Rosie Duffield of the Labour Party. Yes, for those of you who don't live in the UK, the Labour Party is supposed to be the left-wing party, certainly more left-wing than the Conservatives. The only good Tory is a lavatory! Am I right, folks? Eh? Uh, sorry about that. We're going to be talking a lot about toilets and bathrooms and bathroom bills throughout this video. So I thought it best to get the toilet jokes out early. According to this article from The Independent, Rosie Duffield has pulled out of the party's annual conference, saying that she doesn't want to be the centre of attention due to her views on transgender people. Much is already being made of Duffield feeling potentially too unsafe to attend the Labour conference. It is, of course, never acceptable to threaten someone online or off. It's also completely unacceptable to trumpet prejudiced misinformation, as Duffield has been accused of doing. And we'll see that that accusation holds water. Duffield is reportedly still under investigation by the Labour Party for alleged anti-trans activity on social media. And in July, LGBT plus Labour called for Duffield to lose the whip and for Keir Starmer, the Labour Party leader, to suspend her for a consistent pattern of LGBT phobic behaviour. Two members of staff have left Duffield's office within two months of each other. The second female staffer leaving in October last year both cited the MP's repeated comments about trans people as the reason. Duffield has called trans women, quote, male-bodied biological men, as lined herself with gender critical views, agreed with Piers Morgan's comment that only women have a cervix, and liked a tweet that referred to trans people as, quote, mostly heterosexuals cosplaying as the opposite sex, end quote. That is disgusting. These things are not accurate. These things are not acceptable. And according to the uh, writer of this article, Duffield's views are not just outdated and embarrassing, but they are actively harmful. Transphobia is the fear, hatred, disbelief, or mistrust of people who are transgender or express their gender in a way that does not conform to traditional standards. Rosie Duffield's opinions surely fall into this category despite her denials. She insists that trans women are not women, even though it's in the name and has pushed fear-mongering narratives around trans people using spaces reserved for cisgender women. She has also dismissed the existence of trans men and non-binary people, and has publicly supported comments that reduce trans people to dangerous pretenders. 
Again, the writer notes that they can't see this as anything but ugly bigotry, and it has consequences. Trans people have twice the mortality risk of cisgender men and women due to being more likely to experience violence, discrimination, and homelessness. Trans folks are twice as likely to be victims of crime. According to Stonewall, 41% of trans people and 31% of non-binary people have experienced a hate crime or incident due to their gender identity in the last 12 months. Trans young people are also far more likely than their cisgender peers to try to end their lives, with 45% attempting suicide and 92% considering it. But as many of the gender critical brigade are wont to do, Duffield likes to paint herself as the victim. According to Duffield, angry strangers have decided that her beliefs are transphobic. And who can blame them? They're correct. As part of the same Twitter thread on 10th of September, Duffield toots her own horn about how she has quote, actively fought for gay rights and all human rights all her life citing a speech after less than two hours sleep at Canterbury's first Pride event. She also adds her speech went viral. If you deny the identity of transgender people, dismiss the existence of non-binary folk and agree with hateful and bigoted statements about trans people, as Duffield seems to do, your hot air about actively fighting for all human rights is utterly meaningless. Viral speech on two hours sleep, or no. Liberal Democrat leader Ed Davey has defended his party's decision to ban a member from standing as an MP for saying that trans women are not women. He said, the issue that we have been really clear on is that a trans woman is a woman and a trans man is a man. That is the issue that we're fighting on. We believe that trans rights are human rights. Additionally, a senior Labour MP who did not want to be identified, sadly, told the BBC they were frustrated with the oxygen being given to the subject, calling it a, quote, stupid, pointless, manufactured row about rights that were distracting from the issues that needed debating. They added... Let's talk about how every single trans person awaiting NHS treatment is having their rights to see a specialist in 18 weeks under the NHS constitution breached. For example, rather than whether Rosie Duffield thinks everyone should have their genitals and chromosomes checked to go to the toilet. Trans women are under no illusions about what bodies they inhabit. As for... <laughs> The same for anybody else can be said, non-binary people and trans men included. Trans women know what genitals they have, what bodies they have, what reproductive everything they have. We don't need TERFs pointing it out. This whole comment that Piers Morgan made about women having cervixes as well feeds into that, where... Someone as ridiculous as him says that only women have a cervix. And then, obviously, the counter-argument backlash to that is, well, no, trans women do not have a cervix, but they are still women. Then everything devolves into the what constitutes a woman argument. And we will get to that later in the video. The idea that trans people are merely cosplaying is so beyond ignorant. And for someone who is in political power, it makes trans people's lives incredibly dangerous. Trans people are not pretending to be anything that they are not. Trans people are people who are accepting who they are, how they are, on the inside, and trying to show it on the outside. That's all. And stirring up anti-trans sentiment does nothing to help people, even if you think that they're delusional about who they are, which we are not. The fact that she said some unpopular things and has now garnered some backlash from that is inevitable in this day and age. 
because we have access to instantly message people over social network where this just didn't exist 20 years ago. Do I support people who have sent any threats against her life? No, but she still needs to be stood corrected about the harmful views that she holds and hopefully won't then govern based on those views and will govern based on the psychological scientific evidence that is the best we have it as so far. But I doubt that. I doubt she's going to do that. And I feel sorry for Canterbury. So, we have since learned that Rosie Duffield did in fact get her meeting with the Labour Party leader Keir Starmer, who has since made statements saying that the Labour MP was wrong to say that only women have a cervix. Ms Duffield has stayed away from Labour's annual conference this week after receiving threats online from people who regard her comment as discriminatory, which it was. Sir Keir still called for the debate to be conducted in a respectful way. Now, I don't know if it was a mistake for him to say the word debate, because framing the topic of trans people's existence as a debate offers a way in to the transphobes. Now, this is probably just a slip of the tongue from someone who does not know intimately the trans struggle surrounding this particular topic. Um, look... The bottom line is trans people are not debatable. We do exist. But the party leader did not offer any backing for Ms Duffield's comments, which have angered trans rights campaigners uh, who believe that people should be able to self-identify with their gender. Asked whether it was transphobic to say that only women had a cervix, Sir Keir told BBC One's Andrew Marr show, quote, it is something that shouldn't be said it's not right. Denying that would deny the existence of certain trans men and non-binary people who do in fact have a cervix who are not women and places the identity of womanhood squarely on cervix ownership which is weird and is also not how people in society use the word woman. He was blasted by Health Secretary Sajid Javid who described his comment as quote, a total denial of scientific fact, adding, and he wants to run the NHS. Oh, Sag, if you think that psychology, sociology and anthropology aren't in fact sciences, then perhaps you need not be the health secretary or in any position of power at all. Sir Keir said, quote, I spoke to Rosie earlier this week and told her conference is a safe place for her to come. Absolutely. The Labour Party conference should in fact be a safe space for everyone, including misguided MPs. Now she chose not to attend on the basis of the backlash that she received for things that she chose to say, which were needlessly discriminatory. Now, this is half the problem, because... Duffield now feels like the victim in all this for having received threats and garner support from the transphobes and the TERFs who would rather see us not exist. And of course, as per usual, those of us who have legitimate and well thought out reasoned arguments just get lost in the crush with those who are sending death threats to MPs and those who are sending death threats to the trans people. Now, I would have liked to have heard amongst Keir Starmer's words that Labour Party conference is a safe space for everyone, especially including trans people. I think it was necessary to point that out and it's kind of a shame that he did not. Because it is important to say out loud that we should be uh, uh, allowed and accepted there too. And it does make me think that his response to Duffield, he said, not because he truly believes or understands the trans struggle, but because he's saying it because it's politically correct. 
Which, okay, it's all well and good that the Labour Party leader is not a transphobe. That's great. Uh, but that is the least that we should expect from our politicians, really, especially in this day and age. And it still doesn't go far enough in explaining what will happen to Ms Duffield next. Like, what's the status of her job, her position going to be after all of this controversy? Whether, you know, she can in fact represent trans people in Canterbury at all? It's a big question mark that's left unanswered. So, one major reason that this topic about trans people in sex segregated spaces keeps popping up is because it is affecting legislation, which in turn dictates what people do, how they live their lives, all of that stuff, where we are allowed to go as trans people and whose facilities we can use. And it's not just here in glorious Turf Island that these discussions are happening. For example, about three or four months ago, a bill was signed into law in Tennessee requiring businesses to signpost acceptance of trans customers using transphobic language. Tennessee Governor Bill Lee signed House Bill 1182 SB 1224 into law, a discriminatory bill that aims to prevent transgender people from using restrooms aligning with their gender identity by requiring businesses with formal or informal policies of allowing transgender people to use the appropriate restroom to post offensive and humiliating signage. This bill, along with House Bill 1233, an anti-transgender student bathroom bill that Governor Lee signed into law the previous week, are the first bathroom bills to be enacted since North Carolina HB2 in 2016. HB 1182 SB1224 is part of the 2021 Slate of Hate rippling through the Tennessee state legislature. This anti-transgender bill is the fourth discriminatory piece of legislation signed by Governor Lee this session, following SB 228, an anti-transgender sports ban, SB 1229, a sweeping anti-LGBTQ education bill, and HB 1233, an anti-transgender student bathroom bill. These anti-equality bills are being pushed by national extremist groups and peddled by lawmakers in Tennessee in an effort to sow fear and division. The governor has not yet taken action on SB 126 HB 1027, an unnecessary regulation of life-saving best practice medical care for transgender youth. Governor Lee's decision to sign HB 1182 will cause real harm to transgender Tennesseans. Denying transgender people the ability to access a bathroom consistent with their gender identity is degrading and dehumanizing and can have real health and safety consequences. Governor Lee and Tennessee lawmakers are determined to discriminate against the transgender community and roll back the clock on equality instead of focusing on real problems facing Tennesseans. To be clear, Tennessee residents will suffer economic, legal, and reputational consequences of these bills, and we will hold those who are indoctrinating hate into our laws accountable. These bills come from the same forces that drove previous anti-equality fights by pushing copycat bills across state houses. Dangerous anti-LGBTQ organizations like the Heritage Foundation, Alliance Defending Freedom, designated by Southern Law Poverty Law Center as a hate group, and Eagle Forum, among others. At least 60% of Trump voters across each of the 10 swing states say transgender people should be able to live freely and openly. At least 87% of respondents across each of the 10 swing states say transgender people should have equal access to medical care, with many states breaking 90% support. When respondents were asked about how they prioritise the importance of banning transgender people from participating in sports as compared to other policy issues, the issue came in dead last, with between 1% and 3% prioritising the issue. Another more recent poll conducted by the Human Rights Campaign and Heart Research Group revealed that, with respect to transgender youth participation in sports, the public's strong inclination is on the side of fairness and equality for transgender student-athletes. 
73% of voters agree that sports are important in young people's lives. Young transgender people should be allowed opportunities to participate in a way that is safe and comfortable for them. And I'll talk more about the sports thing in the next couple of sections of this video, but for now, I want to focus on these bills. And they don't just involve bathrooms, but all intimate sex segregated spaces. The now infamous We Spa incident is the initial trigger for me wanting to make a video on this topic in the first place. And not that I really want to talk about a topic that has in fact been done to death by several other YouTubers. They have all covered all of the important and pertinent aspects of this particular incident. But what I really want to talk about here is by using this as an example, is what happens when transgender women use women's spaces. See, when it comes to bathrooms and changing cubicles, everything private stays private inside of the cubicles. We trans women, especially Trans women like me, who have not physically transitioned, or completely physically transitioned, are so acutely aware of our biological differences from other women that we don't want to flaunt them. So you might then ask, well why bother using women's facilities if you are so different and don't want to flaunt the differences? Well, because walking into a men's facility looking like this? like. Sis, no. <laughs> I'm too gorgeous for that. But for me and for other trans women, it would be just as weird and uncomfortable and, and you know, possibly even dangerous, if not more so for us than for cis women, to go into and use a facility specifically designed for men. It would just look odd. Saying this, however, I do go into men's toilets all the time as part of my job at work. One of the things I need to do is check the toilets to make sure that they are clean and usable. And there is in fact a sign posted saying that the facilities may be checked by any staff member of any gender. As a short anecdote, I know someone who is what you might call a butch lesbian. Cisgender, but just kind of boyish looking. And there was this one time she told me of when the ladies was just full. So she went into the men's, saw some guys in there, asked, hey, look, the ladies is full. Can I just nip in here and use this one? And the guys were fine with it. Men really don't have that much of a hang up over who uses their facilities, as certainly not as much as vocal turf women do. It seems that most people don't even give a shit about who is using their facilities, as long as it doesn't directly influence or harm them. However, another friend of mine who is a trans woman was, at a certain point in her transition, kind of forced to switch from using the men's facilities to the women's because she no longer fit in at the men's. And that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make here is that we trans women cannot use men's facilities because we stand out, whereas we fit in in a women's facility where we look like we belong. And the same goes for trans men in men's facilities, of course. Because, at the very least, she looks like a woman, whether you, the viewer, believe she is one or not. And that's kind of the choice that we trans people have to make. Either to... <laughs> go into the facility that aligns with our biological sex and risk harassment for looking different, or go into the facility that aligns with our gender identity and then risk harassment for being trans and existing as trans in a gendered space. And that's transphobic. Either way, we get faced with bigotry and are told that we don't belong anywhere. But we gotta pee somewhere. 
the events of what, what happened at the Wee Spa still are unclear. But what we do know is that a few customers complained after seeing another customer in the women's section who has a penis and the woman who filmed the video refused to accept the existence of trans women even possibly existing. Thus it was almost impossible to tell whether or not the person she saw was a man or a trans woman. This woman filming the video complaining about it didn't make the distinction so it was very difficult to tell. However, at this point, I do believe that a trans woman has in fact been picked up and questioned by the police, but not yet charged with anything. The investigation is continuing. The staff at the Wee Spa refused to do anything about this woman's complaints because the spa has a transgender inclusive policy. But of course, about a week later, protesters and counter-protesters came to the spa outside and they came to blows, and that proves... Well, I'm not really sure what that proves. Except, of course, that a lot of people care about this issue, one way or the other, and the discussion rages on. But what I do know is that if it was me being discovered in a women's space with my penis, especially when I'm trying to keep that private, is that, well, I would be mortified. And that's why I avoid communal changing areas and things like that. Showers all together. I mean, <laughs> do I look like I go to the fucking gym? But also, I recognize that I shouldn't really have to do that. There should be a space that I and other trans women can use. You might ask, well, what about gender neutral spaces or gender in all gender inclusive spaces? Well, I'll get to that. So here's where I address the topic of trans men. And I do wish I could go into more details here. So many people have seen this series of photos that I'm showing on the screen now um, posted by this particular individual himself in women's facilities to protest the bathroom bills that would force him to be in there. To be clear and to use his own words, the problem here isn't that a man of any kind or a trans person of any gender is going to the bathroom to spy on you or whatever or otherwise cause you harm. Like that's not the issue. By that everyone involved feels uncomfortable and the women are uneasy with a man in a woman's space and he is uncomfortable being a man in a women's only space uh, instead of a place where he feels like his gender is recognized and even if you're watching this as someone who doesn't accept that trans identities are real you have to agree that this is what he believes and wishes to do in order to be validated. And just between you and me, why anyone would choose the men's room is a little bit beyond me because those places are gross. But hey, sometimes even validation stinks. There are, of course, no discussions about this women's spaces debate, fake feminism, and gender critical views that can be had without mention of the leader of the TERFs, Posey Parker. I am so sick of her nonsense. A Yahoo article reads, one of Britain's most well-known voices in the gender critical movement, Posey Parker, has suggested armed men should use women's public bathrooms to protect them. It gets a lot worse than you even think it will. Parker, real name Kelly J. Keen Minshall, is a notable trans-exclusionary radical feminist with a track record for inveighing trans rights and heckling trans campaigners. Last year she paid for a poster reading I Heart J.K. Rowling at Scotland's busiest railway station in Edinburgh. 
In a since deleted YouTube video, Parker floated the idea of men using women's bathrooms, but more specifically, men with uh, guns. I've had a bit of an idea, she said, about some of the things you can do and men for once I'm talking to you. I'm talking about you dads who maybe carry, I think that's what you say. I'm so down with the American lingo. <laughs> Isn't it so cute and quirky when she's literally insinuating murder? Because what else are guns supposed to be there for? It's not protection and it's certainly not... Uh, feeling of safety and security when people's genitals and everything might get checked and everyone's privacy might get violated by people with guns? What the hell? Maybe you carry, maybe you don't. Maybe you consider yourself a protector of women. Maybe you're that sort of man. Maybe you have a daughter or a mother or a wife. Maybe you have a sister. Maybe you have friends. Maybe you just think women are human and you don't need any absolute connection with them to feel compelled to protect us. What is this bullshit? What is this bullshit? I mean, obviously it's manipulative in an emotional way, but it's also playing on stereotypes that women are incapable of protecting themselves. And it's also... It's also speaking to this, like, cavemanish fucking design of what a man really is. Like, no, please don't do this. I think you should start using women's toilets, men. The call to action plunged countless trans people and LGBT plus campaigners into unease with many accusing Parker of inciting violence, while others questioned her, um, suggestion. And I hate that this article is even hesitant about calling it what it is. Kira Bell, why does this fucking bitch keep entering my videos? Who won a landmark judicial review against the NHS prescribing puberty blockers to trans teens, which has just been overturned, defended Parker, calling for people to leave this woman alone. Ah, oh, bless her. Poor little cotton fucking socks. She has done more for the greater good than a lot of people, Belle tweeted. Oh yeah, because that's how you know it's true, because it's a tweet and that supersedes proof or something. Parker previously drew criticism for appearing on a video with white nationalist and prominent far-right YouTuber Jean-Francois Gariepi. Mumsnet users however, were remarkably fine with it. Mumsnet is kind of like the British equivalent of one million moms, which didn't have a million of them, and is shockingly right-wing. To exclude trans women from single-sex spaces and facilities would not only be regressive, but would put trans folk at risk of a lot of violence, top international human rights organisation bosses have warned. Amid rumours that British government planned to ban trans people from certain public facilities, Human Rights Watch chief Benjamin Ward wrote, this would be a seriously regressive and discriminatory step, which it would. Conversely, there is no evidence that allowing trans women to access women designated spaces, which has been the case for a number of years, puts other women at risk, he added. And here's how I know that it's not about feminism and it never was is that her call to action which by the way is the textbook definition so far as one can make one of those of stochastic terrorism this was directed at men to quote protect women okay no hint that women are capable of protecting themselves not that i of course advocate for women to carry guns and use them in a violent way against trans people or any other people for that matter who just want to use a bathroom there is no way that carrying guns into bathrooms and other sex segregated spaces is purely a defensive strategy this is offensive what do you think people are going to do with guns they are murder tools that is what they are there is literally no other purpose for a gun and if you think that it's just for show, then you are really naive about the length and the depth.
depth and the girth that these disgusting transphobic people will go to to try and eliminate trans people from their society, from their view, in any way they feel fit and appropriate. But I do think that women should be allowed to defend themselves in a non-lethal way. And for that matter, I think anybody should be able to defend themselves from potential attackers as long as they've got just cause for thinking someone is an attacker, not just because, oh look, different. I really think pepper spray should be legal in this country. I used to think it was. It was quite a shock to me to find out that it wasn't. But still, misuse of that would still be a crime. And misusing that against a trans woman in a woman's space would be a hate crime. And look, the majority of us trans people are completely harmless, just as the majority of all people are. And if anyone attacks me or harasses me in a bathroom or anywhere else, like, that is a crime. No matter who the perpetrator is. The last part of that article got me thinking, and further proof, if needed, that this movement is not about protecting women, but persecuting fabricated threats are these examples of cisgender women who get harassed for seeming too masculine. Um, these women that I'm showing on the screen right now, and many more, were accused of being trans as if that's a bad thing, and faced abuse for a perception of gender nonconformity, and that's also misogynistic, because the, this is a lack of acceptance towards all women, no matter their expression. Not only that, but turf ideology is not only transphobic, of course, but it is also misandrist, suggesting that men are in some way predatory just by virtue of being men, or, or something like that. And the fact that they see trans women as men, they think that we're some kind of predators when that's just not the case. And this is the parallel that I've drawn between turf ideology and the so-called militant feminist, or some people might understand the term feminazi rhetoric that existed more widespread in the past but since then the focus has shifted from men to trans women as the perceived attackers. Because the assumption is that all, if not most, men are misogynistic attackers, rapists, and... <laughs> Look, I'm not saying that patriarchy isn't real. But what I am saying is that it's obviously not true that that's the case. And since TERFs believe that there is no distinction between trans women and men, they see trans women as invaders of women's spaces. You see that word a lot. Trying to abuse their proximity to women. Ignoring the fact that abuse can happen anywhere and is always a crime and no one needs to be trans or even fake being trans to break the law. Then again, there are those that go the extra mile. But not only is this rare, but it is absolutely deserving of condemnation by everyone. But what about someone who doesn't break the law, but does stray very close to that grey, blurry line of acceptability. The link for this video is below, but I will describe what I can of it, since I can't actually show it on here. Screenshots will have to do. I'm technologically limited here. So what I'm showing you now are screenshots of an 11 second video of someone who appears to be a man using the women's restroom being berated by other people in there and saying the words how can you tell me I'm not a transgender and one of the women there in that video says no you're not now on the one hand 
no one knows what's going on with this person's gender identity or, or what's going on in, in their head at all. And it's not really for other people to judge someone on the basis of identity. However, this is bad and makes everyone look bad, especially trans women. So first of all, this is someone peeing, standing up with the door of the cubicle open. I've seen men do this before. Um, not women and never trans women. Because as I have mentioned before, we are very acutely aware of our differences from other women and we don't really want to call attention to that in public. Secondly, this person is not making any attempt to appear female. They have facial hair, no makeup, men's clothing, etc, etc. Like, I'm not saying a woman can't appear this way, but again, with every trans woman I've encountered, and, and just known, like, we would hate this. We would not want to be stood there, standing out, being so blatant, being called attention to like this. And it is kind of a manly, man-spreading power move, like pissing with the door open. That, that, is a, that is generally a man thing. So the claim that this person makes that they are in fact transgender is, from my personal and professional opinion, dubious because of my lived experiences and the experiences of other trans women that I know. I want to reiterate that we trans women are using the facilities that match our gender to try and blend in, not face harassment for our own safety here. And thirdly, I know this is really a nitpick, but we trans people know enough about grammar not to call ourselves a transgender. I will never call myself a trans unless I'm being ironic. And this isn't just cringy or embarrassing. Like, this makes trans people look bad. By claiming to be trans, this person makes all of us seem that like we're gonna do this and cause other users of these spaces to get uncomfortable. Um, you know, by violating the boundaries of privacy. To be fair, this is about as bad as it gets with this video. Um, there's no attempt in trying to attack or sexually abuse any of the women or any of, of the other bathroom users there. Um, which is what extremists would have you believe. But it's still an illustration of the type of conduct that transphobes are warning everyone about that really isn't justified because this is a standout case. This doesn't happen all the time. Trans women do not do this. Every trans woman I know would not do this. As you can see, I'm such an expert in sports ball. So I want to preface this chapter by saying I am so sick of this old chestnut. <laughs> the discussion surrounding trans women in athletics came to a head about two and a half years ago, to my knowledge anyway, when a YouTube creator known as Rationality Rules, real name Stephen Woodford, released a very controversial video on the topic. I have already discussed this at the time. I was a part of the big backlash that happened. The shockwave of this video sent a ripple effect through the entire online atheist community, the divided allies, and since then I have not heard the end of this. Like I said, I already made a video about it, I don't really want to talk about it at length here. When so many people have talked about it, until, you know, apocalypse come, and then the apocalypse came and people were still talking about it. Just 
<sighs> Obviously, I'm pro trans inclusion. Trans women are women, and to compete as anything other than that is incorrect. Unless or until the concept of separating competitors by gender is changed or disappears completely, we have the system that we have, and, and that might be more idealistically utopian than is practical at this time. Uh, the video by Jesse Gender outlines a few reasons why. However, I think that the recent events at the Tokyo Olympics are worth discussing surrounding the transgender weightlifter Laurel Hubbard of New Zealand. Hubbard's controversial debut made her the first openly transgender athlete to compete in an individual sport in the 125-year history of the Games. Upon exiting the competition, she said, Of course, I'm not entirely unaware of the controversy which surrounds my participation in these Games. And as such, I'd particularly like to thank the IOC for, I think, really affirming their commitment to the principles of Olympism and establishing that sport is something for all people. It is inclusive. It is accessible. The 43-year-old is almost twice the average age of her competitors and having shifted 285 kilograms during qualifying was also one of the strongest in the field. Athletes are eliminated if they fail to record at least one valid lift in each of the two parts of the competition. Hubbard's participation has been as divisive an issue as whether the game should have even gone ahead during the global pandemic. Critics have argued that her inclusion was unfair on other competitors and that Hubbard is naturally stronger. But is that really true? Hubbard transitioned in 2012 and competed in international weightlifting for the first time in 2017 and has been the focus of both support and criticism in the build-up to her first Olympics. She met the qualifying criteria on levels of testosterone set by the International Olympic Committee, which revised its rules for trans athletes in 2016. Joanna Harper, who is working on several studies on transgender athletes at Loughborough University, says Hubbard certainly has physical advantages over her female competitors. In general, transgender women are, quote, taller, bigger and stronger even after hormone therapy than cisgender women, she says. Those are all advantages in many sports, including weightlifting, Ms. Harper tells Sky News. Whether those advantages are unfair is a whole different question. It's very important to make that distinction. We allow advantages in sport. In fact, we celebrate them. What we don't allow is overwhelming advantage. For instance, we let left-handed tennis players play right-handed tennis players, even though left-handed tennis players have advantages, but we don't let heavyweight boxers get in the ring with flyweight boxers. It's certainly true that Laurel Hubbard does not have an overwhelming advantage against the women she will be facing. Ms. Harper, who helped write the Olympics guideline for transgender athletes in 2015, says China's Li Wenwen is favourite to take gold over Hubbard, but the New Zealander has a realistic chance of a medal. After transitioning to female, age 35, in 2012, it would be another five years before Hubbard competed at international weightlifting competitions, and she achieved immediate success. She won three events in Australia in 2017, including the gold medal at Australian International in the heaviest women's division, lifting a total of 268 kilograms. Despite meeting the eligibility requirements to compete after demonstrating her testosterone levels were below a certain threshold for 12 months before the event, her victory proved controversial. Samoan weightlifter Ionaria Sipaya who competed in the same category, said Hubbard's involvement was unfair. Telling the Samoan Observer, we all know a woman's strength is nowhere near as male's strength, no matter how hard we train. But here's the rub. Laurel Hubbard's not a man. And she wasn't physically male at the time. But there was more criticism as Samoa's Prime Minister said he was shocked that Hubbard was allowed to take part in the women's event. Hubbard achieved further glory at the 2020 Weightlifting World Cup, winning a gold medal before she was chosen for New Zealand's Olympic team after the Games were delayed by a year due to COVID. 
Belgian weightlifter Anna van Bellingen voiced her opposition to a transgender woman competing in the women's event at the Olympics, saying the situation was, quote, like a bad joke. But Hubbard received backing from Australian rival Charisma Amo Tarrant, who said, I have so much respect for her, while New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern insisted all parties here have simply followed the rules. The IOC cleared the way in 2015 for transgender athletes to compete at the Olympics as women, provided their testosterone levels are below 10 nanomoles per litre for at least 12 months before their first competition. Some scientists have said that guidelines do little to mitigate the biological advantage of, of those who have gone through puberty as males, such as bone and muscle density. But supporters of transgender inclusion argue the process of transition decreases that advantage considerably, and that physical differences between athletes means there is never truly a, play, a level playing field in sport. However, Hubbard is likely to be the only transgender woman competing against cisgender women in an individual sport. Ms. Harper says critics of Hubbard's involvement in the women's weightlifting event should look at the bigger picture with few trans athletes competing at the Games. The focus on just one athlete is misguided and misplaced, she tells Sky News. Trans women aren't going to take over women's sports anytime soon. And that's very true. We see that in the result of what happened that day. Competing in the over 87 kilogram category in Tokyo, Hubbard overbalanced on her opening weight of 120 kilogram, taking the bar behind her shoulders. Her second attempt of 125 kilograms was ruled invalid on a majority decision by the referees. The third try was similar to the first, ruling Hubbard out of medal contention. And yes, I know this is one anecdote about one person, but notice how the transphobes aren't talking about the outcome. That's because this instance doesn't fit their neat little narrative about big, beefy, muscly trans women and their so-called natural advantage to dominate women's sports. And the truth is, post-transition, it would be impossible for Laurel Hubbard to have any kind of even ground with cis men. But she does now stand on equal footing with cis women. Or as close to equal as one can get when natural human variety exists, at least in the over 87 kilogram category. But this is just one example of what happens when things go right towards inclusion and acceptance. Transgender former wrestler Mac Biggs, who was forced to compete in women's wrestling in high school, says his mental health is still recovering from his experiences and that he feels like he's winning and losing at the same time. Mac Beggs, a high school wrestler, tells his story as part of a Changing the Game, a new Hulu documentary that focuses on three young trans athletes. Described as a talented and hardworking athlete, Mac has won a state championships in women's wrestling but says this has come at the cost of his own mental health. The documentary shows the cruel irony of crowds heckling him while parents and spectators attacking him for competing in a category he himself doesn't even want to be in. It feels like I'm winning, Mac says, but it also feels like I'm losing at the same time. Texas's University Intergalactic League requires high school wrestlers to compete on the team according to the gender marker on their birth certificate. Mac has faced serious issues because of this, including a 2017 lawsuit filed by a parent att attempting to ban him from competing. He won the girls' state championships twice after that, despite wanting to be allowed to compete against men, and despite the fact that he is taking testosterone as part of his transition. Beggs gained international attention in 2017 and 2018 after he won multiple wrestling titles in Texas, while being forced to compete in the female category. In 2017, Beggs won the Texas Girls' State Championship in the 110-pound weight class, and he maintained his undefeated record as he won his second title match the following year. Beggs had wanted to compete against men whilst wrestling in high school, but a state ban meant trans athletes were forced to compete on teams that aligned with the gender on their birth certificate. He was also subject to a lawsuit from a parent who wanted to ban him from competing. The lawsuit was dropped, and the parent said he had changed his stance on Beggs' right to compete. Beggs spoke out amid a spate of bills attacking trans inclusion in sport. 
North Carolina introduced on Tuesday, the 23rd of March, a bill that would ban trans youth from competing in sports teams that don't match up with the gender listed on their birth certificate. Local news station ABC 11 said North Carolina is now the 30th state to introduce such legislation. Beggs said he thinks it's disgusting that so many bills have been introduced, with many being supported by anti-LGBT plus conservative groups. He added it was revolting and honestly appalling that such groups are trying to pass the bills as sports are a vital outlet for kids. So it would seem that this is what happens to trans guys who are taking hormones who want to compete in sports and athletics. And it would also seem that the hormones might have given him the advantage and allowed him to win those competitions that were then made unfair by him being a trans man in the wrong category. Why do you never hear about trans men competing with other men? Mm, maybe because of this, because bills that are being passed to outlaw it. We'll, we'll still have to wait and see what happens when someone does something like this at the Olympic level who is a trans man. And as long as sports continue to be separated by gender, it seems that we trans people will be forced to feel like the villainous wrongdoers, no matter if we compete with others of the same birth sex or others of the same gender. Then I think that's the ploy that the transphobes are operating here to make our lives so miserable no matter what we do or where we go, that we go away or at least you know, that's what they would like us to do. But we're not going anywhere. We are here to stay. Transphobes be damned. Like, some people are trans. Get over it. And some of us want to compete in sports. I'm not really sure I would, but hey, not all of us want to sit around playing D&D. &D, so, hashtag sorry not sorry. But this does beg the question, if we are sticking around, where do we go? So, some people have suggested that we trans people should have our own separate spaces, as if we are all some third gender, which is inaccurate and also kind of unfair when it comes to things like sports, because we just won't be even. Now, I do have to admit that this proposal does come with some benefits as well as downsides, so I want to look at both. On the plus side, having trans-specific bathrooms, changing rooms, sports leagues, um, all of that would appear to remove some of the controversy surrounding our presence in sex-segregated spaces. And honestly, I think a trans-only safe space would be a way to avoid certain vilification from outsiders. We'd all be able to understand each other's position and just be able to sort of get on with things, you know. Um, no one's gonna sneak peeks over bathroom stalls or anything to say, oh, you're, you're clearly just violating my privacy. Like, We'd avoid all that bullshit. Avoiding the vilification for having unconventional bodies. Like, great. But using that logic is what gets us to other categories of segregation, like fat bodies and skinny bodies, or black people and white people. And, you know, maybe, maybe not. It could just be a fallacy of, of slippery slope that I'm going down here but we have already seen what happens when we start saying separate but equal and we see that it ain't all that equal besides which appeasing transphobes is not really going to solve the problem of making us trans people safer this approach treats trans men, trans women, and non-binary people as all the same, which, you know, we're all trans, great, love being under that one encompassing umbrella so that we can, in fact, share that particular sense of safety with each other. 
and we are all similar enough that certain things might work like trans bathrooms for example but it's still a failure to acknowledge that we have separate genders and it isn't really what we are after and again that Jesse gender video that I mentioned explains why it just wouldn't work for sports settings but most importantly just imagine for a second the amount of targeted violence and harassment that we would then face for being seen visibly going into trans-only spaces when a lot of people in society are still massively transphobic. Doing that action, going into a trans-only space, immediately outs someone as trans, whereas a trans woman who looks like a woman who goes into a woman's space is basically just stealth which is kind of how a lot of people want to live day to day, including myself. Like, yes, I will mention to people that I am trans and I'm, you know, saying this online in a very public way, but to someone who doesn't know me, I don't want them to know that for fear of my own safety. The suggestion is a far cry from the blending in as our lived gender that we are looking for. And we have been doing quite peaceably for decades now. Just under the radar. So what about gender neutral spaces then? We'll just abolish gender altogether and all of the segregation that goes along with that. And then boom, utopia, right? Look, I know not a lot of people are gonna get that visual gag, so I do have to explain it. This is the album cover for Björk's latest uh, album. It's called Utopia. I really love it. And I know it leads me to then having to explain the joke, which makes the joke not funny. But just go listen to the album. It's, it's a wonderful piece of music. But anyway, realistically, I just don't think that society is ready to make such a huge upheaval. Some places are not equipped for gender neutrality yet. And I think such a change, if introduced, would have to be done incrementally uh, because, you know, some people don't want it, including some trans people. Who's ready for a dose of reality? So, how do we, as a society, dictate who goes where? A trans-exclusive view rooted in biological essentialism, that is, we just use birth sex and that's all there is to it, a room for penises and a room for vaginas, uh, which unfortunately ignores intersex people altogether, would be impractical and really reductionist. I'm a person, not a set of genitals. And this is a criticism that you might hear from transphobes. TERFs don't want to be called vagina owners or uterus havers any more than anybody else might want to. And that's kind of valid because that sort of language is clunky, to say the least. But the distinction is that we in society use gender far more frequently than biology. And when it comes to medical language, precision trumps convention. So while an article written for people who menstruate is mostly aimed at women, it acknowledges the existence of trans men and non-binary people who do menstruate and also excludes prepubescent girls and postmenopausal women or anyone who has had a hysterectomy or who would otherwise still be classified as a woman. So I said that the thing that we use in society to make the distinction is gender, not biological sex. And the trans exclusive viewpoints doesn't accept the distinction between sex and gender. Despite the fact that gender is real and does have tangible effects that we can monitor, much like the wind, it's an invisible force, but we can still monitor and like observe its effects. 
What I'm trying to say is that men and women do get treated differently based on assumptions and stereotypes by people who have never seen the genitals of the people that they're interacting with. Even something as simple as pronouns, which are cultural byproducts of two social constructs, gender and language. These are applied to people as we see them, not based on biology. I mean, it would be unfair or untrue to say that there is such a thing as biological pronouns, despite what the bench appearers of the world would have you believe. Doctor, the baby, it's French. But you're not a woman. You weren't born with a vagina or uterus. Why should we waste resources and time on this topic? It's basic biology. You'll never be oppressed like a real woman. You're just seeking validation for your own delusion. All this talk of male brains and female brains is nonsense. How dare you try to claim our sacred spaces as your own? So here we are, the real crux of the discussion. It's not about who uses which toilets or who gets to compete in which sports with whom. It's about trying to invalidate trans people. It always has been. The rest of that stuff is just a smoke screen. Bathroom bills and testosterone levels of athletes and the sanctity of womanhood, whatever that's supposed to be, is all just a front for bringing transgender identities into question in the first place. And it doesn't even provide much of an answer. Not that that's the goal. It's not meant to. Just the fact that the discussion is being had injects an element of doubt enough to make trans people a target and is intended to force us back into the closet. But, as I previously stated, we aren't going anywhere. And the point is, the overall point is, that we know where we are supposed to be. We know who we really are. Because we know who we are better than anyone else does. You can't expect someone else to know what's going on in your own head. And the point is that trans people are correct when we assert who we are as our reality, as our collection of lived experiences. We should be the ones to determine where we go. And look, you can accept that or don't. It's really your choice. But practically speaking, just let us piss in peace. Now that's a hard pill to swallow. And the trans excuse <laughs> by say fat bodies and skin bodies, skin bodies, <laughs> such as bone and muscle, de muscle by the limb by I can't say the thing. When, oh for fuck's sake! Hello. Ah, uh, I'm super uncomfortable. <laughs> so I am entering this discourse from a position that trans women are really men. Oh shit! No, I'm not. <laughs> or for some people, <laughs> the one you trash and <laughs> fuck. I can't even see the envy flag behind me now. Okay. <laughs>